From bloated and tired to free and inspired, welcome to Free and Inspired Radio with Philip Watkins, your weekly dose of everything digestion and mental health related. We hope you enjoy this episode. Here is your host, Philip Watkins. Yes, yes. Hi there. Welcome to another episode of Free and Inspired Radio. I'm your host and naturopathic practitioner, Philip Watkins, and I'm grateful to have you with us today. If you're new to the show, well, the title says it all. It's all about feeling free and inspired and exploring the many different avenues you can take to get there, whether it's deep dives on digestion and mental health solutions or guests who offer their own stories and answers. I hope I can be the type of guide you can rely on to unlock the agency you have to reach your own mental and physical competency. Let's get started with what's coming up on today's episode. Coming up on this week's show. In this episode, episode 12, welcome. My name is Phil Watkins. Nice to meet you if you're just joining us. In this episode, we are asking the question, is histamine making your mental and irritable bowel syndrome symptoms worse? I feel that histamine is most well known because of antihistamine drugs than its actual effect on the body. It's no wonder as allergic rhinitis or hay fever is thought to affect 10 to 30% of the worldwide population. 10 to 30% of the worldwide population is affected by allergic rhinitis or hay fever. And that statistic was from 10 years ago. So who knows where it is now, but... We've all been affected by histamine actions on the body at some stage in our lives, but hay fever and skin rashes aside, there are more profound effects of histamine in the digestive system and the brain that you might not be as clear on. Most of my patients are surprised about how intrinsic this amine is, and this intimate relationship is exactly what we're going to be exploring in this episode of Free and Inspired Radio. So let's get started. What is histamine? Seems like the most logical place to start. Histamine was discovered over one. 100 years ago and is considered a master amine. It plays a critical role in immune defense, neurological activity, growth and development, fertility and nutrition. It wasn't actually until 1927 that scientists realized that it played a role in anaphylaxis. So if you're new to that term, that's when you eat a nut and you need to go to the hospital. Uh, when they compared histamine in levels in the lungs before and after an episode of anaphylactic shock. The majority of the advances in our understanding of histamine following uh, um, understanding of histamine have come from discovering different histamine receptors in various cells throughout the body. An easy way to think of receptors is the lock part of a lock and key mechanism where different functions are opened, forming some type of response from a cell or tissue. So there are four different types of histamine receptors that, hist- that help histamine create different outcomes in the body. And contrary to a popular belief, histamine can be both inflammatory, which we're most familiar with, but also anti-inflammatory, which makes it fairly important for the balance of the body. So let's explore the role of each of these four receptors uh, a little more, and that may help to explain in some cases where your antihistamine drugs come from, which unfortunately we won't be looking at too much detail today, but it may just at least give you some understanding of where these things come from and what they're doing. So histamine 1 receptors drive the movement of cells, the detection of a painful stimulus, dilation of the blood vessels, so something that decreases your blood pressure, and bronchoconstriction or the tightening of the lungs, which if you do suffer from allergies, you probably are familiar with. H1 receptors are is a receptor f- responsible for the classical, more classic allergy symptoms that we're familiar with. The histamine 2 receptor or H2R plays a role in producing your gastric juices in the stomach. Hello, digestion mucus production in your airways, hello allergies, and the ability of the blood vessel walls to allow molecules like nutrients, water, and white blood cells to pass through them. The histamine 3 receptor, and we're almost there, plays a role in neuroinflammatory disease, which we'll be discussing further later in this article, and that's a big surprise for a lot of people. And the histamine 4 receptor is involved with allergy inflammation differently from the H1R. And we'll come back to explore this H4R a little a little later as this particular receptor is involved in more chronic inflammatory conditions. 
Often we think that histamine is a result of an allergic response, but I wanted to bring this up because foods high in histamine provide a disproportionate amount of histamine in our bodies, so it may not actually be all the environmental stuff that we're used to. This high consumption of histamine-based foods has seen many successful outcomes for people on low histamine diets who either have a large amount of it in their daily dietary consumption or have trouble circulating it out of their bodies. So let's look at some of these foods with the highest amount of histamine, and I wonder whether or not this these foods are high in your diet if you're listening to this with an interest to help yourself. So here we go, the foods that are high in histamine here. Meats and seafoods, so such as pork, mackerel, anchovies and tuna. Fermented foods, a big one for the last two to five years, so that's soybean paste, kimchi, yogurt and cheese. Instant and fast foods often have very high amounts of histamine. Tomatoes, nuts, including peanuts, alcohol, including wine, green tea, chocolate, grapes, bananas, strawberries, and citrus fruits, such as lemons, oranges, and tangerines. And this is always very interesting because I literally had a patient uh, a few months ago who had really interesting uh, symptoms of eczema when she ate citrus fruit. So this, once again, can be an, a very um, interesting connection if you're you know, wondering why you're getting some of these uh, stranger symptoms. So this list was taken from an interesting study around a low histamine diet and the treatment of uh, chronic urticaria, which is something we just mentioned for that other patient. However, this episode will be exploring more so how histamine interacts with the gut and the brain. And after the break... That's exactly what we're going to do, starting with how histamine can affect your memory, sleep, and even behavior. So stay tuned for that. We'll be back with more on Free and Inspired Radio. Woo! Time to take a break. Are you enjoying this episode of Free and Inspired Radio? There's no better time to take back your personal health sovereignty. If you want to connect with more free and inspired episodes, simply subscribe to your favorite podcast platform or visit the website at www.philipwatkins.health for more information. Let's get back to the show. Yes, yes. Welcome back to Free and Inspired Radio. I'm your host, naturopath Phil Watkins, or Philip Watkins, if you want to be formal about it. And in this episode, we've been exploring histamine. In part one, we looked at some of the fundamentals of histamine. And in this final part of the show, we're going to be delving deeper into the role that histamine plays within the brain and the gut. So let's just start off with the brain. Initially, scientists didn't actually think that histamine traveled past the blood-brain barrier. So it's actually the last organ in the body that histamine was discovered to play a role in. We know that histaminergic or working on the histamine system networks play a crucial role now in various brain and central nervous system functions, such as, wait for this, sleep and wake cycles, learning and memory, and your eating and feeding and energy balance. So these are things that people may not necessarily connect histamine with. Based on these interactions in the brain, researchers are now investigating the role of this histaminergic system in neuropsychiatric conditions such as Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, Tourette's syndrome, narcolepsy, and schizophrenia. So if you're new to narcolepsy, that's an involuntary uh, well, condition where you basically involuntarily fall asleep. And it's uh, I've actually seen a patient with narcolepsy and uh, the poor thing, she actually fell asleep around 15 minutes into our session and apologetically told me that she was going to do so before we'd even started the session. So these conditions very, very much affect people's lives. And histamine, would you believe, may actually be the secret behind helping people further. Brain histamine levels are actually lower in Alzheimer's patients where exponentially higher levels of histamine are found in brains of people living with Parkinson's and schizophrenia. So they're actually already doing studies on the amounts of uh, histamine that may uh, play a role in, in these kind of things. Now it gets more fascinating. Did you know that histamine can drive the intensity and direction of your behavior as well? This is fun. One of the more interesting papers around histamine in the brain has more to do with how histamine can affect the motivation that drives human behavior. There's been lots of speculation, and I was one of the people that got sucked into the speculation. I kind of remember it around about 2015. 
that there's such a thing as a high histamine-based personality. Now, a quick search on PubMed shows that very little research confirming this hypothesis as yet, but the absence of the journals doesn't necessarily mean that it is not the case, just that you, we are yet to understand if it is true or not. In saying that, early research is now linking histamine and serotonin together as a, another potential sustaining factor in depression. So that's an interesting one there again. I think I use the word interesting and fascinating quite a lot, but hopefully you'll be able to learn to live with it, but I'm getting distracted here. So this paper named Histamine and Motivation discusses some of the roles that histamine can play in the types of behavior that either bring us closer to something positive or away from something negative. The paper frames this by looking at drug addiction, which is a very clear example of moving some towards something positive or negative, and what happens when dis dysfunction in the histaminergic system in the brain causes decreased motivation or apathy. Now, my patients are often amazed at the extent to which histamine can affect the body. But what about the digestive system? We touched on the brain. If you're a regular listener to this show, you'll know that the theme is always around the connection between the brain and the, the digestive system. And histamine's role in the digestive system is definitely worth looking at. Histamine plays a prominent role in the digestive system and irritable bowel syndrome, would you believe? Since you've listened to Free and Inspired Radio or even read some of the articles on philipwatkins.health concerning the digestion and the immune system, you may have actually heard me mention a statistic that 70% of the immune system resides in the gut. And I always feel like it's important to remind people of this because it's very, very intimate. I offer this patient, uh, offers this to people and to you now, the listener, more as a way of explaining how that intimate relationship between these two systems can be. And a, another example of this intimate relationship is histamine's effects on the digestive system, and most notably irritable bowel syndrome and inflammatory bowel disease as well. Two immune cells, mast cells and basophils, produce histamine, and we know that histamine is present in exceptionally high amounts when an inflammatory response is underway. Now, these increased amounts would make sense considering one of histamine's jobs is to mobilize inflammatory cells where they are needed. There are three main functions for histamine in the digestive tract, two of which may heavily affect people trying to solve IBS. The first is that histamine enhances gastric acid production. So if you've listened to episode two or three, we've explored how the inability of the gastric juice to reach a particular acidity can be the origin story or sustaining factor for people with small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or IBS as they're not effectively digesting their food properly. Now, the second is the modulation of a process called motility, which we refer to as one of the causes of constipation or IBS and small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So just to recap there, histamine affects gastric acid acidity, and also affects motility, two of the main processes involved in either small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or IBS. So here's some exciting news for those who have stumbled on this page or because or this episode, excuse me, uh, because they think histamine is connected with their IBS or they have uh, other symptoms like allergies concomitantly. One of the critical reasons why histamine is now an essential consideration in the management of IBS is that a low FODMAP diet has been shown to decrease histamine levels in the body. And whilst the study revealing this was small scale, so I think it was only just under 40 subjects, which, look, let's be honest, is not very high, uh, the subjects only com completed the low FODMAP diet for three weeks, which is actually 50% of the duration of the maximum amount you can do the FODMAP diet for. So maybe there was some further scope there. But this study was randomized and did show promise for people who feel as if their IBS may be unresponsive or in the case of some of my patients have gone through a SIBO protocol and have still come up with some kind of lingering uh, symptoms, if you like. But wait, there's more when it comes to the digestion and I find this fascinating. There could be another reason why histamine affects your digestive system, and this is down to the uninvited guests who have set up colonies within your gut digestive system without you knowing. Now, in other articles, we've discussed how gram-negative bacteria may not be helping your digestive system, least of all if you're suffering from IBS. But did you know that some forms of fish can expose you to bacteria that create more histamine? 
Examples include strains that often pop up in comprehensive stool testing, such as Morganella morganii, Enterobacter aerogenes, Hafnia alvi, Citrobacter freundi, and Escheria coli, or our friend E. coli. In more serious circumstances, bacteria like this can actually cause what's called a scombroid poisoning around 24 hours after eating mishandled fish, with symptoms very similar to that of an allergy, such as mouth numbness, headache, difficulty swallowing, thirst, hives, and facial swelling. But because of the nature of the fact that it can take 24 hours, oftentimes this can be missed by either practitioners or even yourself if you're trying to assess whether or not food is uh, being a problem for you. Now, another consideration with bacteria and histamine within your digestive system is that various probiotic strains from the lactobacillus species can naturally create histamine as part of their generalized function. Examples of these probiotic strains are lactobacillus ruteri, commonly used for motility, lactobacillus casei, and lactobacillus dobruki subspecies bulgaricus. How do you reckon I did pronouncing that? If you have a problem with that pronunciation, leave a review and I'll send you a price. So even by taking a probiotic, you could be unintentionally increasing your histamine levels in your body, which is not really what you want if you're already suffering from histamine-based symptoms. These could already compound things, but all this without mentioning even an allergy. Now, the focus this episode was to broaden your understanding of the role of histamine in the brain and the digestion. This connection is just the tip of the iceberg regarding histamine's varied and profound role within the body. Rest assured, though, we'll be exploring more of this over the coming weeks and months. Still, for now, I hope this article has increased your awareness on how even fish and probiotics can influence the global levels of histamine within your body, potentially making your IBS symptoms worse, along with your focus, sleep, and memory. It's like, wow, what can I do? Fish is supposed to be good for me, right? Well, look, it's not all levels of fish, but it's the key here is to actually handle the fish properly so that means putting it in the freezer when you buy it not leaving it out at room temperature and some good hygiene food hygiene uh, rules there for you so what do you think like most of the early kind of more introductory episodes of the free and inspired radio show i can guarantee this won't be the last episode on histamine i mean we haven't even touched on histamine intolerance or sensitivities yet or how you can combine a histamine and small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or SIBO treatment and histamine foods or low histamine foods for better outcomes in IBS. I know I'm teasing, but rest assured over the coming months we'll be going deeper into everything that I just mentioned. Before we finish this episode of Free and Inspire Radio, if you would love to hear more from me and get the word on new articles, podcast episodes and a whole lot more jump over to the website philipwatkins.health i don't know why i use the term philip there uh, philipwatkins.health is the easier way to <laughs> explain it join our community via the newsletter sign up on the home page there'll be some interesting prizes for you if you do sign up you'll be able to see the transcript for this show as well at the same place where you'll also be able to see the references i've used to create this episode of which i believe there were 22 if you're interested in the ongoing reference count here now your reviews on apple Podcasts and and spotify help me get the word on the street and if you're listening to this on youtube throw the video a like and subscribe to see when each new podcast is uploaded Now, I wanted to send a message to everybody who is struggling this month. A lot of people seem to be either getting unwell or facing new lockdowns or new rules, especially in Hong Kong. And I want to send a big shout out to you if you're finding it difficult with all of these new lockdowns or new rules. It won't last forever. Please keep your head up. Look after your friends and family and loved ones and even some strangers. And I look forward to joining you next week. You made it to the end. This show is all about you, and we hope you finished this episode feeling one step closer to feeling free and inspired. We'll be back next week, but if you want to know more about Philip, please catch a digital flight to www.philipwatkins.health for further details about how we might be able to help. In the meantime, have a great morning, afternoon, or evening, and we'll see you for another episode next week.